Hey everybody, Harv here. Let's continue our lecture on chapter 22. So we're going to start this lecture off talking about women. Uh, and we're going to be talking about feminism and modern feminism. So if you go back to this class, right, feminism and uh, um, gender, um, women's rights have been a huge, huge theme in, uh, and topic within this class. You know, going all the way from De P.C. on the, re the Renaissance to um, Wollstonecraft uh, and De Gouget, the suffragettes of the 19th century, um, feminism is something that's really important and something that we have talked about extensively in class. So um, one of the more modern feminists was Beauvoir, and she um, she wrote The Second Sex, and she was exploring, you know, how she was, she was critiquing the patriarchy, and she was really critiquing how being a woman made a difference in her life. And she argued that women are not just, you know, disenfranchised on a, disen, uh, you know, had disenfranchised and had disadvantages on a political scale, but on a social, cultural, um, and economic scale as well. Um, and we're going to see, uh, you know, with modern feminism uh, and modern feminists that they're going to be critiquing European and Western culture uh, on a whole. It's not just, you know, fighting for specific rights, um, but it's, you know, a critique. Um, you know, you're going to start to hear things like, uh, oh, you're, you know, you're mansplaining. You know, it's 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 a very much uh, it's a critique of European society, um, on a uh, you know, and looking you know specifically at gender and gendered relations. Um, there's a big emphasis in modern feminism feminism on women controlling their own lives. Um, obviously, that goes hand in hand with abortion, which is a very controversial and contentious issue in the world today, especially in the United States. Um, but mo so modern feminism, you know, it's, it's, uh, very much a theme in the world today and very much alive and well today. Um, now, uh, during the post-war period, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see the number of w married women in the workforce rise sharply. Um, we're going to see this in the middle class, working class women, uh, start to, you know, enter the workforce. And a really good example of this is my own mom. I mean, uh, my mom, uh, she grew up in the cold, uh, cold war, the post-World War II era. Uh, and man, as soon as she uh, graduated high school, she had a job and she was putting herself through college. Um, this is going to start after World War II. Um, in the 1930s, we're going to see less single women uh, because of a low birth rate in the 1930s. Um, so this is mainly in the post-war period. Um, where child care is not provided, less women are going to enter the workforce. It's pretty self-explanatory because, you know, women uh, taking care of uh, children is very traditional and uh, women are seen as the primary caregivers to children. Um, in the 20th century, uh, another big change that we're going to see, especially in families, is no, uh, children are no longer you know, going to be expected to contribute substantially to the family income. Um, this is obviously goes hand-in-hand hand with uh, compulsory education, uh, and this is going to lead uh, a lot of married women to join the workforce, well, because kids are going to be in school. And so, you know, once a kid starts preschool, Kindergarten parents can go back to work. Um, also, women are gonna this women are gonna uh, uh, work to escape isolation in the household. You know, being relegated to the domestic sphere. Um, and childcare has become a huge, huge issue and um, part of you know uh, the welfare state, especially in Europe, is the fact is you know uni universal childcare in Norway and some Scandinavian countries and some European countries. They provide for universal uh, child care where it's very affordable and where parents, you know, can drop their kids off um, at various different ages to, you know, be taken care of so they can go off and work. Um, and, uh, you know, this has become a really large issue. And this is something that's um, uh, that's being very much debated in the United States today. Um, you know, work pattern for women is going to be very consistent. We're going to see a lot of single women, a good example of that is my mom, to begin work after school um, and work, you know, after marriage. They may leave work for a little bit to care for young children, but some may not. Um, when I was born, um, my mom taught while she was pregnant for me. There's pictures of her pregnant with me teaching, and she had me, and she was back to work, and I think... I had some babysitters and some care, some uh, caregivers for a couple months, and my mom took care of me for a couple months. Uh, but then she went right back to work. Um, so women women are working more and are 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 being a more prominent um, force within um, within the economy. 
Um, you know, women go are going to go to work when their uh, children are old enough to go to school. But some women even, you know, find some type of childcare, daycare. Um, you know, family might, you know, be able to help out and take over uh, and help, um, you know, take care of child. And, you know, women will go back to work. Um, and what, something that we're seeing, ladies and gentlemen, is that women are having less children and having children later in life. Um, and that's really be, uh, being impa uh, impactful with the workforce. Um, I was, you know, I'm in my 30s and I, you know, am not ready to have children. Uh, my mom had me when she, uh, when she was in her early 40s, um, late 30s, early 40s. And that's a more of a common theme is we're seeing, you know, um, couples get married a little bit older and couples having children a little bit older. Okay. Uh, and and uh, you know the average age that we're seeing of people having children, people getting married, is in their, more in their early twenties and their later twenties in the West. Um, and so these are you know really interesting dynamics that are that are uh, that are currently changing the world today. Um, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, many of the nations have shown you know little concern for women's uh, issues. Um, e e economic difficulties in the region have really limited the number of health and welfare welfare programs. Um, and we and we know that it's very tr traditional and typical of Eastern Europe. As you know, we we know they're a little bit behind. Uh, let's talk a little bit about knowledge and culture in Europe changing um, because of higher education. Um, we are seeing, um, you know, and because of compulsory education, we are seeing, uh, you know, knowledge being more widely available than before. Um, we're seeing a more uh, Europeans and the United States. Uh, you know, a more educated population with the internet coming about, excuse me, um, in the, uh, during the, uh, the, the 1990s, early 2000s, and, you know, today in 2020, man, the internet is everywhere. Um, we are really in an age of information where information is, I mean, wow, you can go into Google, you can go into YouTube, you can go just search things up and learn how to do it. Information is widely available and accessible, and we are seeing more and more people, uh, populations becoming educated um but we're, we're going to talk about existentialism a little bit i want to um i want to kind of hold off before i talk about that we're going to talk about it uh, uh soon um but with uh you know mass populations being educated we're we're starting to uh, see you know a massive movement towards environmentalism uh and and uh, european I, I believe her name is greta thunberg I, I don't know if i'm pronouncing her last name but europe is really leading the way when it comes to um the environment and uh, environmental justice and environmental reform, um, and uh, it's a European Greta in uh, in Sweden who's kind of leading that. But um, that's something that's really, really important and really big today. That has uh, you know uh, is a really important issue um, is the environment, and that can be due to education and people learning about it. Um, let's talk a little bit about communism in Western Europe. Um, you know. Until the final part of the 20th century, Western Europe did have communism. Now, it's, it's really important in, within the Cold War to understand that, you know, even though Western Europe and the United States and the West tried to, you know, contain communism, that doesn't mean that there weren't communists in uh, Western Europe. It, it is important to note, though, that they did not hold the majority of power. Um, during the 1930s, when liberal democracies were struggling and fascism was rising, communism was seen as a method to protect liberalism. Um, and communism was also on the rise. Uh, but, you know, communist supporters in the West became disillusioned um, with communism, with Stalin's purges, the um, Spanish Civil War, the Soviet invasion of Hungary, uh, the Nazi-Soviet pact. Um, so in Western Europe, it really didn't take as strong as a hold as it did, obviously, in the Soviet Union and in the East. Um, uh, George Orwell, he, he commented extensively on uh, communism, he expressed his disappointment with, St uh, with uh, Stalin's pact. Um, uh, you had other intellectuals, um, you know, comment on uh, communism um, and, you know, have a lot of disagreement amongst themselves on, you know, policy when it came to communism. Um, uh, you know, there, there was uh, one, one solution that a lot of communists uh, had when it came to, you know, discussing their ideologies was to redefine communism. Um, you know, a lot of his unknown uh, writings have been published in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, and, you know, that's kind of influencing a lot of communist thinkers to um, redefine what he meant 
to kind of refine some of his ideas and uh, you know give you know maybe some new meaning to what communism really is. Okay, um, you know with the fi financial crisis of today, and um, you know is leading some thinkers to return to Marxist thought and socialism. You know with the rise of you know some economic discussions, with the rise of some of the far white far right groups that have been um, uh, on the rise within Europe and in the United States. Um, you know you're starting to see at the same time socialism. Uh, communism kind of creep back into the narrative um, of politics and society. A really good example of you know socialism come back is obviously with AOC in New York and Bernie Sanders. And those are some examples um, in uh, the United States. But com you know communism is just is, I kind of put this slide in here just to let you know that communism in Western Europe did exist. There still are communist groups, um, but they they really weren't as prevalent um, as in the East. Okay. Let's talk a little about existentialism, and we'll um, we'll see how many slides we have left. But existentialism is an ideology that's really interesting and going to um, you know come about in the the late 1900s. Now, um, existentialism is the belief that human beings are responsible for their actions, and that human beings have caused a lot of dread, um, anguish, and destruction, and um, death. And this is an intellectual movement that is um, really captures the mood of the uh, 20th century, the mid 20th century. It's very pessimistic, um, and it's it's very much um, it's very much analogous and very similar to um, romanticism. This is a this is a, 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 an ideology that believes that thinking begins with our subjectivity, the human subject, not reason, and it's a philosophy against reason. And we're going to get into why. It's uh, very much Influenced by the writings and ideas of Nietzsche, remember he declared that uh, you know Christianity is weak, that God is dead. He believed in the importance of uh, feelings and emotions. And Kier Kierkegaard, he was um, considered the father of existent uh, existentialism. Uh, he maintained that um, that humans give meaning to life, not religion, um, you know, not society. It's us that that humans that give meaning to life. And and part of the um, reason why we're seeing so much pessimism and uh you know so much of of a mood of um you know anxiety and depression and these negative emotions is it's really capturing what's the mood of the 20th century world war one great depression fascism world war ii cold war right it's it's really it's really trying to embody the destructive nature of these world wars and really and it's really you know, motivates a lot of intellectuals to question whether human beings are in control of their own destiny. And if, you know, reason and rationality are good things because, you know, and this is very similar to romanticism in that, right? They were, after Napoleon and the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, you had the romantics questioning, hey, was this all a good thing? Man, look what just happened. The Napoleonic Wars, the French Revolution, it was all crazy. Existentialists are doing the same thing. They're kind of questioning, man, is reason and rationality really, really good? Because we just, you know, used reason and rationality to come up with an atomic bomb that just blew apart Japan twice. Is that a good thing? We just had these crazy world wars. Now we have, now we have nuclear bombs. Is that is is this science and rationality and law? Is this is this good? So they're really pessimistic and really questioning um, reason and rationality. Um, you know, and so this trauma of World War II, of the Cold War, of World War One, is really going to question, you know, reason, science, logic. Um, romantic writers, you know, did question reason, but they were much less radical. Um, you know, existential thinkers are going to really focus on some radical negative emotions, death, fear, anxiety, depression. Um, and that's going to be, you know, a theme within their, um, within their writings. Um you know, according to existentialists, human beings are compelled to formulate their own ethical values. Um, and human beings, you know, create ethics and human beings independently act and, and human beings define values, create values and create society. And, you know, if we create society, and this is kind of the, the overarching question of existentialism, if we create society, how do we come up with a society full of war, death, nuclear bombs? you know, racism, all these terrible things. Like if humans, you know, come, you know, 
to find all this stuff and create all this stuff, how can we come up with a world like this? And it's it's just a, it's a very interesting um, train of thought, and it's um, very much an intellectual movement that is still alive today. Um, now, a big change, and I kind of touched on this before, is education. Education changes a lot, and uh, you know, a big part of um, education within Europe and the United States is going to college, university populations. And there's hundreds of thousands of students enrolled in universities in the um, in the West, in the United States, and in Europe. Um, and in the 60s, a big, a very um, prominent movement was, you know, stu student rebellions. And that was in the United States and in Europe. And part of this was due to the Cold War, um, you know, Vietnam, um, you know, and there, there was a lot of different motives for this, but that, that became a big theme is, you know, these, these counterculture, these, these liberal protest movements really were rooted in, um, in the university population. Um, you know, in France, they were protesting Charles de Gaulle, Czechoslovakia, protesting communism and the Soviets. Um, student rebellions were largely unsuccessful in society in the 1970s, but, you know, were still very much had their mark on, um, on society and, um, and, um, you know, today still, you know, universities are sources of, you know, protests and, and uh, you know, gi giant movements. Um, and here's an example of a protest. And it's still very prominent today. Um, during um, when I was in college at UCLA, um, wow, we had huge protests and huge, um, huge, um, you know, uh, movements when um, the university, when the state of California was raising tuition. And, you know, we had students from UC Davis, at, this is at UCLA, Berkeley, um, UC San Diego, they came on campus and there was, you know, a huge march. And, you know, the, the, this protest culture um, is very much still alive and well at the university level today and in Europe. Now, something really interesting um, that, you um, has been going on that I've seen in my travels in Europe is the Americanization of Europe. During the, during the past 50 years, the United States has exerted not just a lot of economic, political, and social influence, but cultural influence in Europe as well. Um, uh, you know, and this, this can be seen, uh, you know, economically, politically, socially through the Marshall Plan, NATO, military bases, um, you know, popular culture, tourism. Um, and so there's been a big spread of American influence in Europe. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible. I mean, you can go to Europe and there's a McDonald's, there's, they're, they're wearing Levi's, they're wearing, uh, you know, Nike's Jordans. Um, it's, there's been a big Americanization of Europe in terms of culture music. I mean, you have, uh, rap, which started in America. Now you have Italian rappers, you have German rappers, Russian rappers, English rappers. Um, and so there's been, been a big, um, Americanization of Europe in, on so many different levels. Um, you know, music, movies, television, shows from the U.S. have also, you know, come to Europe and, you know, be, been, you know, become very popular. Um, you know, casual American clothing, like I said, has become the norm. Uh, I went to, uh, you know, a shop in, where was I? I think I was in Copenhagen. Yeah, and it was just a, a shop of Jordans. I was very much, you know, embodying American culture. Um, and that, that's become, you know, quite a norm in Europe. Um, American English has become a norm in Europe. Uh, the, the English language uh, itself has become a norm in Europe. Uh, in, in Europe, you know, they're not just taught, you know, German, French, or, you know, they're a traditional European language, and English is a traditional European language, but we're seeing English be, you know, used throughout um, Europe and Part of that is an influence of the United States. Um, there's been some resentment from people who do not want to lose their European culture. Um, uh, so some groups have, you know, really, um, you know, kind of pushed back against this Americanization of uh, European culture. But it's it's uh, there it, there is still a huge influence of American culture on Europe today. Um, let's go through a couple more slides. Um, Western Europe has become very much a consumer society. That's just a big proponent of capitalism and the West. Um, a huge expansion of consumer goods and services. And this is, uh, you know, one of the key differences between, oh, I put between twice, oops, between Eastern and Western Europe. In the East, um, you know, you have low quality economic goods, um, you know, long lines for common goods. Automobiles are, you know, typically more rare. Um, you have less urbanization, less development. 
Uh, in the West, is a huge expansion of consumer goods. You have, you know, modern smartphones, modern, you know, um, fancy cars. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of consumer goods, more urbanization. Um, so that's that's a big difference between Eastern and Western Europe. Um, and this consumerism that you know started in the 1700s with the Industrial Revolution, with capitalism, is now very much a defining characteristic of Western Europe. Um, uh, people in Eastern Europe seeing, you know, this consumerism, seeing how much money and prosperity it brought to the West, um, were very discontented with that because it wasn't, you know, that was not part of communism and that helped bring down communism because people were so disenchanted, uh, chanted and so, um, you know, envious of that consumerism and that prosperity seen in Western Europe. Uh, the environment, well, uh, something I talked about before, uh, with Greta, uh, Thunberg. Um, concerns about pollution, the environment grew in the 1970s, 1980s. Obviously, now with climate change, it's a huge concern, and Europe is right in the middle of it. Um, but by the 1980s, environmentalists, environmentalists became very important politically in Europe. Um, the Green Party uh, was a very influential political party that started in Germany. It was really concerned about pollution and global warming. Um, and it was really clear in the 1970s that the environment of Europe was devastated by economic expansion. Um, dead fish in London, acid rain in Germany and Sweden, um, deforestation, um, and you know the green movement and environmentalism has become a really important uh, political player in Germany, um, but also uh, in the world. Uh, we're having huge environmental movements, um, you know, internationally, um, and Europe was really a, a, a nexus and a catalyst for this. Um, uh, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in Russia raised more questions about um, nuclear power, but the environment as well. I mean, it was disastrous for the uh, for the environment, um, with large amounts of radiation just pouring into the natural environment. Was that good? Are humans being responsible with nature? Can we survive with this lifestyle? Um, and so, Europe and the world, and you know, it's really important to talk about today. Europe and the world have had to confront this issue that you know transcends national borders. It's not just a German issue, a United States issue, a Chinese issue, a Japanese issue. The environment is an international, global, human issue, um, and uh, it's really confronting some you know nations and businesses to keep you know economic growth in mind while the environment is in mind. I mean, and some you know um, groups are really. Um, and some, uh, you know, businesses are really thriving off of environmentalism. Look at Tesla, for example. I mean, they are based on the environment and they are becoming a global uh, powerhouse when it comes to automobiles. Solar, the solar industry is just booming. And it's, you know, a business that's promoting, making money, but at the same time trying to do something good for the environment. So that's just something that's becoming more and more prominent. And uh, the environmental movement in uh, its 2020 uh, is only going to gain traction over the next 10, 20 years. Um, let's stop here with art, ladies and gentlemen. We'll stop here. Uh, thank you so much, and we will continue our lecture later.